Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tina Campton, and as one of the co-organizers of the conference, it is my pleasure to welcome you all back and to reconvene for our afternoon sessions. Um, this morning's panel, for those of you who were here, uh, you already witnessed that, but for those of you who were not, it really did um, set the stage in intentional ways uh, for the rest of the conference, but also for these two panels in particular. Um, our first session focused on, or focused our attention on understanding the city or cities more generally, not as mere geographic locations, but as complexly peopled places, places of belonging and unbelonging that are fractured and reconfigured in and through catastrophe and its afterlives. Ariella Azule urged us to engage disaster as an ongoing process that continues to circumscribe the lives of urban residents. Saskia Sassen, on the other hand, asked us to look more closely at the political possibilities that the powerlessness wrought by urban violences might engender. And Karen Till put memory and the memory work of individuals and communities at the center of the process of imagining some of the alternative futures that might emerge in the aftermath of trauma and injury. Yet the question that we face as scholars, as artists act and activists, is how do we access and engage those memories? It's this question that lies at the heart of the work of the September 11, 2001 Oral History Narrative and Memory Project. Our two afternoon panels are devoted to the memory work of its narrators and the oral historians who assembled their stories. Please join me now in welcoming the director of the Columbia Center for Oral History, Mary Marshall Clark, who together with her colleague, Jerry Alborelli, will be moderating our first panel. Welcome. Thank you so much, Tina, and I want to express the deepest thanks to my co-panelists, our narrators, Azorha and Talat. And um, for me, it's a circle, uh, I think the circles of belonging and unbelonging were the perfect way to kick this off and to start, because in reality, that's what we explored, and we have two wonderful people to explore that with today. I think I'd rather stand. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to give you a brief introduction of what we did, what our work was. I say we, and when I say we, I mean 30 interviewers, some who were paid and some who refused to be paid, one of whom is in our audience, Sans Svekovic. Um, I'm so glad to see her here. And just to give you a background on the project so you have a sense of its scope. Several days after the events of September 11, 2001, in New York City, I was introduced to Peter Behrman, the sociologist, then and now head of the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, ICERP. And together we, the Columbia Center and ICERP, began an oral history project that eventually culminated in 1,000 hours of conversation with over 600 people taken over time between 2001 and 2005. We were looking for answers to certain questions, and we thought we might be able to find them quickly. Was 9-11, the national story, going to collapse the urban stories of New Yorkers so attached to their global roots and global futures? Would 9-11 really be the national and militaristic turning point in New York that it was claimed to be and the rest of the nation? Would New Yorkers fall in step with the rest of the nation so quickly who so quickly accepted the government's rationalization of not one, but two wars. Would those who experienced such extraordinary suffering in lower Manhattan be able to support the killing and maiming of other innocent people in their name? And soon later we would ask, would New York fight against the xenophobia that swept the nation from shore to shore and even infected our own communities? We had the hubris to think that these questions could be answered quickly. We were soon humbled. One story led to another and another in our efforts to understand the complex and diverse subjectivities that informed each life history we took and every community we worked in. We interviewed a huge range of people, 
iron workers, restaurant workers, poets, taxi drivers, street vendors, paramedics, psychologists, teachers, Muslims that worked at the Trade Center, Muslims in detention, and Muslim and Sikh and Arab leaders who were forced to account for who they were then and in the years that followed. We talked with nearly 80 Latinos, mostly from Mexico, who soon began to leave in the political aftermath that ensued, as well as politicians and diplomats trying to negotiate the huge national tensions that ensued between this country and other countries in the world, especially the Middle East and South Asia. We learned over the five years in which we did our active field work, um, in which we talked with 600 people, that really what we were gathering um, was cultural and social difference rather than sameness and agreement. So this difference became the norm rather than, and in contrast to, stark contrast to, the idea that 9-11 meant one thing for all people. When we went to Queens to interview immigrants, Muslims, Arab Americans, and Sikhs, we found that the FBI had traveled there before us, moving people into detention or deportation jails. When we stood on unemployment lines and followed people back to their homes in the Bronx in Chinatown, we saw the aftermath of 9-11 on people living at the threshold of poverty, fighting to bring back their family businesses and their community centers. When we talked to artists, we found the traces of injury transformed a new creative work, and we have Zora Syed, an artist, with us today. An artist we don't have, Brian Conley, who lost his studio and his son-in-law uh, on a plane on the day of 9-11 we don't have because he has gone to Afghanistan where he's raised money to start an art studio to help re rebuild uh, an art college to help rebuild uh, the studios of artists whom we bombed. As we listened to everyone, we only found one pattern of similarity. Almost everyone we interviewed spoke in a language that rejected the official and simplistic 9-11 language of war and revenge and superseded the flat and narrow ways in which the mass media rendered 9-11 in the public imaginary. What we found over 10 years were people struggling to find meaning. The struggle for meaning was as important as the meaning itself, and struggling to make sense of their own personal experience against an orchestrated consensus and response. Watching this struggle and being a part of it led us to continue our work long after we thought it would be done. <clears throat> These voices, ones that we took from the collective conversations that simmered beneath the public surface, are the ones we return to you today. For in fact, they belong to the city, not to us. We hope that they are the voices through which New Yorkers will remember over time and through time, telling and performing and retelling again until the real memory breaks through, urgently, defiantly, Claiming, reclaiming the public sphere as its own intimate and infinite space from which new imaginaries, new creations, and new publics will be born. I, I um, wanted to say a few opening remarks of my own. Um, we have with us today, can everyone, can you hear me? We have with us today two women, Zora Said and Talat Hamdani, who refused to be silenced or who refused anyway not to be heard and who have complicated our understanding and the public's understanding of the events of September 11th and their still unfolding consequences. I want to say a word or two more before turning this over to them about how these collaborations and we think of these interviews as collaborations worked. What we recorded amount to spoken autobiographies. Here is more or less how we did it. We asked them to paint their stories in a broad canvas, to conjure up the past in an attempt to understand the present. We asked modest, open-ended questions in response to which we expected to hear, and often did hear, long, the longer the better, surprising answers. We, uh, we told them, this is your story, you will be driving this interview, we won't be, and we meant it. We asked them to address the present, but not the way journalism does, more the way literature does, and at the same time to address the future, because we were operating on the assumption that the future might have a completely different set of questions in mind, and that the answers to those questions might be hidden or implicit in the complex stories we were recording. We took some of our cues from literature, or we learned to. 
We asking them to use descriptive language, focus on scene, characters. We ask them to feel at ease with apparent contradictions. We ask that they tell stories and allow one story to lead to the next, to follow the story's lead as if it had a mind of its own, as if it knew sometimes more than the storyteller and certainly more than the story hearer. We learned to expect from the story or to place our trust in the story as vessel to do what stories have always done best, which is to, uh, rather than to provide easy answers, to raise difficult questions. We're so glad that they're here today to have, so that you can have a sense of what we experience, the power of the story precisely told, its stubborn refusal to yield its final meaning, but also, 10 years later, the power of the reflections of these witnesses to history whose unofficial voices, after so many official lies, are the ones we really need to listen to. Zora, um, when I first met you, um, shortly after September 11, 2001, um, later that year, um, you were a PhD student at City University Grad Center. You have done so much since uh, that time. You have helped so many people, and your work as an activist, a scholar, a poet, a publisher is something we all want to hear about. But I'd like to start like we always start. Where were you born? Oh, feels heavy, but uh, <laughs> you can make it light. Okay, um, I part time as a stand up, but um, <laughs> but uh, I was born in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. Um, let's not talk about the year. Excuse me. So let's not talk about the year. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. We I was born. We won't say the year. <laughs> but I, I was. Uh, my family left before the war in Afghanistan. Uh, my grandmother was in Saudi Arabia and my father had this dream of reconnecting with her. So uh, we were in Saudi Arabia for four years where I grew up, and then we came to the US. So I came to Brooklyn at age five, Sheepshead Bay. So. And would you tell us a little bit about your family? Sure. They are, in my eyes, a little crazy, a little <laughs> sweet, a little um, odd, but uh, we, Got along pretty well in Sheepshead Bay, I think, as far as the diversity of the community. Um, I went to a really beautiful little elementary school, um, and uh, I loved school from day one. I would wake up at 5 a.m. and get ready for school. Um, and, and my dad, my mother, my brother, my sister, uh, we were all born in different countries that we traveled in, so mm -hmm. we were a small family. Pretty, um, pretty anonymous in Sheepshead Bay until I think 9-11, uh, I think suddenly we became known, as I was known in many other places, as the Afghan. So the word Afghan developed a different meaning, whereas before they were like, is this Africa, it's near Malaysia, are you in Australia? Like they didn't know where it was. I think it was after 9-11, it suddenly became very clear that this was the Afghan where this is where the Afghans lived. So um, it was really shocking for us um, that people that we had grown up with were suddenly very hostile towards us. People were very protective of us as well at the same time. You know, you had a split. Um, but it's interesting because nowadays I hear, I'm not in Sheepshead Bay anymore, but I hear about Sheepshead Bay being very resistant to a mosque being built, very resistant to um, uh, the growing Muslim population. But in the 80s, you know, there really wasn't, in the 80s, we were actually the heroes, right? The Soviet-Afghan war made Afghans a bit of a, a hero in their neighborhood. Right? Thank you for that context. It helps us understand. Uh, we talked earlier about um, where you were on the day of September 11th, on the Q train, as I remember. If you could just recount a bit of that, and then we'll move to the aftermath. Yeah. Um, I was teaching Arab American Lit for the first time at Hunter College. It was uh, a big move and we were all excited about it. So I was actually up early to go teach my class and I was on the Q train. Um, we can move on. No, it's, it's okay. But it's just very present 
still, I think. But I was reading, and there were all these people looking out the window once we got over the bridge. The Q train goes over the uh, Manhattan Bridge. So you see the Twin Towers. You see all of New York. It's beautiful. It's like a postcard, uh, especially at sunset. So we were passing by. This was probably 9 something AM, and uh, it was on fire. I saw it on fire, and there was smoke, and everyone's up. You know, oh, what's going to happen? Um, but I went back to reading because I thought, you know, New York, you don't really get up and stare at things. You just move along. <laughs> you mind your own business. What, you know, you, and uh, I thought, oh, well, you know, they'll just put it out. I mean, you don't really think about how, you know, you, I didn't think about, I didn't feel, I mean, I think I grew up feeling very invincible as a New Yorker. So you feel like, oh, someone's going to take care of it. No big deal. And we were going under, uh, we were going back into the tunnel, and the train conductor said, Really nonchalant. Uh, planes went into the Twin Towers. Uh, some of the trains have been rerouted. Next stop, Canal Street. You know, I mean, it was very like, oh, all right, you know, big deal. Mm -hmm. But. And you was. later walked home over the bridge, right? Yes, I walked home. Well, I, I went to, um, I walked all the way from, I didn't end up going to Hunter. I think by then we found out. 34th Street, we saw smoke and. Uh, me and a colleague walked a little bit. Uh, we were walking around with a, a radio that was unplugged. I don't know what we were going to do with this radio, but it was supposed to connect us somehow. We were very nervous and about what was going to happen. We were near the Empire State Building. And I ended up just walking and walking and walking. And uh, there were no trains. There was no telephone. Um, and I walked over the Manhattan Bridge with a group of people. It was incredible how quickly communities developed. Sort of there was a leader. Someone said, come on, let's all go together here. Let's work as a group. People were, after the bridge, people were giving us water. But um, the walk over the bridge, I noticed that people who didn't know each other were just coming together to just help each other and just sort of be companions on this walk, which was uh, quite powerful. Um, and it was very hard to see, you know, you see the dust on the water. Uh, there was a group prayer. Uh, this, this guy was like, we're poor, please don't, we're hard workers, please don't, please don't attack the bridge as we're walking over it. And it was very eerie, it was all the fear. I mean, I grew up in the 80s, all these fears of, you know, global nuclear attacks and suddenly everyone, you know, the sh highways stop and people are walking on it. It was a very frightening idea for me growing up. And that's exactly what had happened and it mm -hmm. brought back it made very real the stories of the war in Afghanistan. Mm. It was some way I was like, oh, this is what it feels like. This is. And yeah. the reason I asked about your family um, earlier on, which might have felt like the wrong place to ask, but the reason I ask is that later, as you told your story again and retold it to a smaller group of people we had together in 2003, you went back to the memories of your grandparents talking about walking through the city mm. with blood on their shoes. Yeah. Um, it's so hard for me. It's, it's, I didn't realize how hard it would be. But okay, well, it, we can no, move it, to an it, easier subject. Yeah, it, it's, it's very, um, it's almost like you're, it's a way of connecting to memory in a very visceral way. And then I think the meaning of parents, the meaning of grandparents, I don't know, it just really changed for me uh, when you experience that kind of vulnerability. But... So the other part of what we are all really interested in hearing is your response as an activist, a poet, a scholar, and now a publisher, um, and the creative worlds that you occupy and how you began to live through the aftermath, which was hard too, in that yeah. raw kind of way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, in one way, I had just started teaching college, and I didn't have any experience. How do you teach? during wars? I mean, how do you teach during, you know, after uh, such a catastrophe about um, the same people who are being profiled, who are being stereotyped, and people come in, students came in with, you know, different levels of, of um, uh, stereotypes and sometimes uh, anger. So it was very difficult for me to figure it out, but at the same time, I think it was difficult the first couple of days. I mean, I had to stay home the first two weeks because my, my department was very uh, nervous about how students would respond to me. But I think what I did was I just, I don't know how appropriate this is, but we all hugged as uh, teachers and students. And it, 
after that, I really, um, I realized the power of empathy, the mm -hmm. power of it's okay to be emotional and reach out and to teach in a way that can incorporate humor, uh, compassion, and literature and film and arts, which was a good way of uh, breaking this kind of uh, barriers between um, one kind of people and another kind of people. So uh, that was one way that I think really helped me find a, a voice or a, an approach. And um, that emotional thing, of course, transfers into poetry, into literature, into you know finding kinds of writings that would you know break. Um, one, a language of victimization, another, a language of, you know, anger, you know, so it would really offer a much more complex, um, what is that, range of, of emotions and, and um, messages with politics and news and, you know, um, I always find that, uh, you know, maybe this was something that Diana, I think it's Diana, Diana De Prima says this, and where she says poetry had more news than the news. And I feel like uh, in these gatherings of artists, in the gatherings of um, whether it's events that we did, that we held, or interfaith um, poetry and literary connections, or film even, and even classrooms, the, the publishing, the work, the Afghan American anthology that we ended up putting together, me and a friend, uh, it really uh, was about kind of learning how to take turns being in each other's space and uh, offering that perspective of, you know, connection, so. Thank you. I want to ask you something else we talked about was that you were interviewed for our project, but then we hired you to do interviews for our project. And I wanted to ask you, because you were, you were interviewing people your age and sometimes in your group about the mm -hmm. changes happening within the community, yeah. and just to comment in general on uh, oral history that you've been a part of since then. Yes, I think one of the most powerful things of this um, project was to be asked uh, about your life from the beginning, not necessarily from the moment of, because I think while we're talking about um, you know childhood in, in these beautiful childhoods or whatever, we all have beautiful childhoods, I think, um, to be able to enter into what happened 9-11 was, was gradual and natural and, and holistic, I felt. And I like to take that approach. And it was excellent reaching out to my community because I hadn't, you know, our community is very, um, we were a young community, I guess, or new. And uh, there was this idea that you didn't really talk about the things that, uh, you suffered from. So this idea of suffering and talking about it was not really appropriate, right? So you would have very polite responses to it. So it was very interesting to not only one, record it in English and hold the interviews in English, but also to, um, which allows a lot more freedom, I think, of expression. And only because the native language would have all the formalities and the, um, the uh, how should I talk? I mean, am I going to speak for my family? Am I going to speak for myself? That sort of formalities was, was lightened up a bit. And uh, the interviews actually helped every work that I did. I mean, the training that I received, I worked um, on an arts project later, and we used the same techniques of talking about people's lives first and then the incident. And we were able to um, really put together a great 10 years after 9-11 community members and poets having a conversation, but oral history was a major part of it, major part of the Afghan American anthology. Uh, I don't think I could have collected the data that I collected if I hadn't interviewed, you know, all of these Afghan Americans and community leaders too, so it was exciting. I just wanted to ask one final question. Um, when we met in 2003, you hadn't written poetry for a while, you know, because of this period of confusion and irrational guilt you felt and all of that. What were some of the transformations that happened inside of you to be able to let you to write again? That's a tough one. Um, I did. When nine, um, when, you know, there was this one moment. Let me start with that moment. It was the film of this Afghan-American who had been uh, killed a month after 9-11. And the excuse that the producer had used was that um, he was so angry about what had happened in 9-11 that he wanted to kill someone Afghan. 
the reality was much more di much difficult. I mean, much more complicated financial issues. But that was the excuse used in court. And I remember when we finally got the film completed. It was Fire Dancer, and the filmmaker is Joey Wassell. It was all over the news. Um, I remember being in an Afghan traditional dress in front of Ground Zero. You know, it's a Tribeca Film Festival. And I just felt a tremendous amount of guilt. And I wasn't sure how to process it. The war had started already, so there was, um, you know, there wasn't, it was still the height of um, excitement for Afghans going back, right? Afghan Americans going back. It was Afghanistan was rebuilding, you know, nothing could go wrong. But it was a very complex place, and I didn't know where it came from, but I did f feel extremely guilty, and I couldn't articulate that. Um, and I couldn't create art out of it because it was right in the middle of happening. Uh, I don't think I was able to write until maybe, uh, you know, 2003, another friend of mine was killed in Afghanistan as well, and I think that really was the turning point for me to be able to, you know, you're called to write about these lives and you're called to write about your own life, not in a very self-indulgent way. This isn't like being a confessional poet and you have to write about, you know, how you feel, but it's, it's, it's the history, you're not writing about yourself, but the history that brought you to this place. The history that brought me here is why I'm here speaking. I don't really think I'm a very important person, but all of the things, the generational histories, is why I feel compelled to speak, create, write, interview, because it gives me that range of possibility for lives that I didn't lead and for people who couldn't speak for themselves. When I interviewed my father for that poetry project, I didn't know he had all of this you know, racism at work. He didn't talk about it. Um, but in English, and because it was going to be performed somewhere else, he told me all of these things that were terrible that had happened. But he was very, you know, he didn't make a big deal out of it, but it was very interesting for me to be able to connect and find that out and to connect with other lives. So. What a beautiful place to end with the history because now we have a, another really historical story to hear as well. Thank you. Thank you. And what a good place to start with the history because I always say, I mean, we. Um, are interested in, we understand that posterity will be interested in knowing who exactly is addressing, who's telling the story. And so we start at the beginning, wherever you decide the beginning might be. Um, but would you start by talking a little bit about where and when you were born, some of your early memories, some of your early experiences? I was born in Karachi, Pakistan. My grandma was a midwife, so she delivered me. and. Uh, come from a family of eight siblings. Both my parents were educationists, you know, really high profile. And uh, growing up in Karachi, Pakistan, I remember reflecting back that I always fought for my rights and at each and every moment of my uh, small steps moving forward in life, my liberties were curtailed because of my gender. I mean, I was told not to play in the streets because I was a girl. I was told not to whistle because I was a girl. And I was told, you know, not to talk in a loud voice because I was a girl. My mother-in-law told me that too, you know, <laughs> years later. Yeah. So uh, uh, my father refused to teach me driving because, you know, he said, you know, you're a girl. I said, is it a sin to be a girl? And so I, Jerry remembers I took him on a wild ride, you know, I said, let me show you how much I know how to drive. So finally he was convinced that before I get killed or something, he said, okay, okay, I'll teach you how to drive, okay? <laughs> and uh, so, and in that country, but there's one thing that I will always be grateful to my parents, they were both educators, so they gave us the best of education. Eight siblings, I'm the youngest daughter, uh, four of us are medical doctors, and the other three boys became uh, different engineers. I'm the only one who took after my parents' profession. And um, I fell in love with my husband, and uh, the parents, the families, both the families were against each other, although we were both Muslims. Uh, they were from different sects, so there was a, a big issue for both the families. And I stood my ground, he stood his grounds, and we got married. And then uh, we had Salman uh, in 77 December, my first child, Salman Hamdani. 
And my husband was very ambitious, so he wanted to, he was ambitious, you know. I mean, I came from a family of educated family and reasonable middle class, but you know, well off, so to say. He wanted to move forward in life, so he was able to get a visa from, to come to America as a journalist, He's, he was a journalist. So he came here in 78, and I followed, you know, in February 79 with Salman, who was 13 months old, and I, I remember arriving at the airport, and um, the gentleman at the airport immigration said, how, how long do you want to stay here? And I said, as long as I can. Because my, my ticket was for four months, so I figured, you know, as long as I can. That was the only question he asked, and he says, speaks very good English, <laughs> wants to stay as long as she can. Will she ever go back? And a big question mark. <laughs> <laughs> and he put it in my passport and said, see that red flag room? Go over there. And that's where I ended up. I was very nervous, and Salman was crawling on the floor. Finally, they called my husband in, and he came in with, you know, his attitude nonchalant. Said, what are you doing holding a, you know, a journalist's wife? I'm going to put your name in the paper. And the officer says, yeah, here's my name. Okay, don't forget to write my name in there. <laughs> and so he gave us, he gave me like two weeks visa to stay. And we came, you know, came out of the airport in New York City. And uh, that's what I remember coming to New York. And I came to Brooklyn, New York also, Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And uh, as a, as a sequel to it, you know, like we, we had to go back to get a visa, you know, to the immigration at 26 Federal Plaza. So I went down there with my husband's friend, and he said, you know, put Salman on the counter. It was, this is going back like how many years? 79, 30-some years ago. So it was a small window sill at the immigration, so he said, put Salman over there and pinch him. And when he cries, they will process your application very fast. <laughs> And I did that, and, the, but what, and he gave me one more advice, don't speak good English. Because then they'll keep asking. So it was so difficult not to speak good English. Because I'm an English major, I taught English in my country. <laughs> so he said, you got to go back. Yes, me go back, me go back. Me come husband, visit husband, me go back. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, you know, we renewed our visa by mail on generous grounds, and then we filed for, you know, immigration, and it became legal, and uh, that's my history. <laughs> Good. Good. Okay. Um, we know that, that you lost your son, Salman, on September 11th, and I wanted to ask you to tell any version of that story that you're comfortable telling in this, and, and what happened subsequently. It's tough. Or since we know it, you can talk about what came later. Um, no, I want, I want New York to hear what we went through, what I went through as a mother, what it is to lose a child who gives his life. Salman grew up and he, made, he graduated that year in June, June 6th from Queens College, chemistry major, and he wanted to become a medical doctor. And uh, he was an NYPD cadet. He did his EMT certification. He went. So that day, it was a Tuesday. It was a very nice, crystal clear day. And my second son, Adnan, was at Binghamton. He was out in college. The youngest one was at home, Zeeshan. So Salman was 23, and Adnan was 19, and Zishan was 17. So we left for, I dropped Zishan off in the morning at 7.15, and I went to my school, middle school 72 in South Jamaica. And when I came out of the classroom at about 10.20, 10.19, I saw teachers talking, and I said, you know, maybe the superintendent has come talking up like a raid on the school, how the school is performing, and they were talking about the towers fall being hit. And, uh, and one tower has fallen, so I said, no, no, something is wrong with my hearing. Let me go and call my husband. So I went and I called him, and he was, all he said was, my Salman is there, and he was crying. And I said, Salman cannot be there because he does not work there. Salman worked in Manhattan at Harvard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, uh, 65th Street and York Avenue. 
So I said he could, he is not there. He will definitely go there to help later on. But at that moment, and then he's, he said, the, the second tower is falling. And I found myself crying and I said, then I remember wiping my tears and I said, I don't know anybody who works there, so why am I crying? But that is where they found his remains uh, in October, you know, in 34 pieces by the North Tower. And uh, the tragedy is that instead of acknowledging his sacrifice, uh, you know, the media and the media was not, also not so much responsible as is the, uh, I would say, the NYPD. They, they were, they, uh, they was, they cast suspicion on him as though the, he was linked with those attacks. And the way we found, discovered one of the customers that my husband's store told us that there is a flyer circulating, the MTA. And he used to work for the MTA and he informed us that there's a flyer circulating with your son's name, you, you better get in contact with the congressperson. So we got in touch with Congressman Ackerman. And so after six months, we went through, he, he interrogated us, there were officers who came to our house, they wanted his uh, computer, they wanted his password. I said, you must be kidding. You expect a child to tell his mom his password? <laughs> you know, how naive. So, seriously. Um, then after, you know, I wrote a letter to President Bush also, and Ackerman uh, made us write a letter to Ashcroft. Uh, so by the end of everything, you know, like after, after like three, three weeks of interrogation, he was pretty much satisfied. And now Ackerman and I, we are on good terms. And, uh, but they confirmed his death six months later. Uh, which uh, on, on March 20th, uh, which was, you know, uh, 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 I couldn't understand why the delay in confirming it, you know, why not tell us immediately. So there was this false hope that maybe he's alive and he's detained. And actually we got a letter because Salman also helped establish uh, uh, a chemistry major uh, professor over here, his lab in the year 2000, uh, 2000, right. So or 2001 it was, he worked here in the summer. So I remember getting a letter from here also that he's languishing in some cell. That's why I got, uh, there was this hope that maybe he's at Guantanamo Bay. And uh, uh, it was like going through, you know, the, when you have the hopes dashed again. So we had his funeral in April and the NYPD, you know, gave him a very nice funeral. Salman was a very, you know, very humble, very compassionate, kind, uh, vibrant, full of life, young man. Uh, he loved children, he loved animals, and uh, uh, very humble, and uh, uh, honor to him was, you know, we attended uh, somebody's uh, uh, funeral, which was given by the police, and he said, Mama, that is honor, and that is how I want to go. That was in 99, and two years later, that's how he went, three years later, in 2002. So. Uh, and because of what happened to me on a personal, you know, level, uh, having lost a child and who adopted this country, I adopted this country, and then to be accused of interrogated, uh, of uh, being maybe your link, because, because of what? Because of my faith? So what if I'm a, I'm a Muslim or he was a Muslim, uh, or I am from Pakistan, you know, I mean, it changed the dynamics of the moral values of my country here. And it made me question, you know, why this change? And uh, 10 years down the road, you know, I, I started, you know, like two years later, uh, my husband died also of grief. He just couldn't bear it, losing his, you know, firstborn child. And he also died. And that's when Jerry had interviewed me in 2005 after my husband died. So, there is a legacy here. This is my son's legacy. No, I mean, thank God I was able to redeem his, you know, uh, dignity immediately after the, the, when the funeral was announced. It was announced that he was uh, not, a, it was an, uh, a statement that yes, he was a, a proud American. He was a hero. And his uh, sacrifice is acknowledged in the Patriot Act, which itself is a very egregious act, which has to be repealed 
but slowly and surely the administration, the Obama administration is uh, making those small, small rules very permanent now. So a lot has changed and uh, a lot, there's a lot of work to be done, I, I feel. And uh, uh, we need to get our country back on its moral keel again. Yes, I understand 9-11 happened. It was done by uh, whatever, 18, 19 terrorists, but they were foreigners. They were not domestic. None of them was, were Americans. So why, are, why is, you know, uh, Peter King scapegoating, you know, and uh, nine years later, last year was a very horrible year with the Park 51 issue. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, you know, and uh, we need to stand united as a country. It's not a, a Muslim issue or a, or a Christian issue. It is an American issue. Because today it is one race or one faith, and tomorrow it will be another race and faith, you know. So that is where I stand right now. Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of, you've become a very public person. Um, and some of some of the stops along the way. I know I met you. You were involved with Families for a Peaceful Tomorrow. Yes, Peaceful Tomorrows uh, for September 11th. Families for Peaceful Tomorrows is an organization which was formed in uh, spring of 2002 by family members who lost their loved ones on 9/11. And the mutual feeling is that you know uh, wars are poor chisels for peaceful tomorrows. Martin Luther King's statement and also we try to you know we are against violence and wars we don't we disagree with the two wars that were fought as, as a byproduct of 9-11 and the peaceful tomorrows is also uh, very uh, active in uh, restoring the rule of law campaign and one of our asks is you know to close down Guantanamo Bay because it's a byproduct of 9-11 and so 2002, we became members. They reached out to us, and uh, uh, five after my husband died, I became very active, uh, lobbying. We went lobbying a lot, you know, with Peaceful Tomorrows against Guantanamo Bay and restoring the rule of law. We met with many different congressional and senators' offices, and um, some offices were very receptive, and some were as though we are just aliens. They would nod their head and they would go yeah. And then that was it, you know. And uh, Senator Graham's office is very, uh, very, very extremely, you know, on the other side of our platform. He's very pro-military and, you know, all for wars and everything. Uh, so that we, I lobbied. And then in 2009, I think it was, after President Obama became the president, we were invited with other 9-11 victims' families to meet with Attorney General Eric Holder regarding Guantanamo Bay, and he, um, he said that uh, he, categorically we will close it down. There will be three different types of um, criminals or you know, segregations, those who can be addressed in military courts, those who can be addressed in federal courts, and those some who may be just detained indefinitely. And that does not make sense to me you know, indefinite detention uh, by executive order. And right now they're trying to make it uh, implemented in any part of the world. You know, and I say they, I mean the exec, the, the White House, so the administration right now. So, and uh, at that meeting, there were three of us from Peaceful Tomorrows, there were other members also, victims, families, and everybody, you know, made a statement, and the general opinion was that the statements were all against Muslims and Islam. And then after I spoke, and some of them, you know, toned down their hate speech, you know. But the sentiment was there. What I experienced day one, the, I, the sentiment was growing in the country. And then in 2009, again, later that year, I went to Guantanamo Bay itself. Uh, although Salman was buried, everything was done. My husband was dead. It was like seven years after the fact. But somehow I was still in denial, you know, and when I went to Guantanamo Bay, we, we were, actually we were flown from the Andrews Air Force Base in DC and to Guantanamo Bay, and we actually arrived at a, an island, and from there we boarded a boat, and we, 
I think we, was, we were on the boat for like 45, 50 minutes, and then we came to the island itself. And the island itself was, you know, you could see there was a uh, very separate, segregated, and you know, you could see yes, the, it's the modern version of a dungeon, you know, from the uh, old stories that you read about, you know, in the British times. But so it was the modern American dungeon version, uh, but it was above ground, and they were very brand new construction. Uh, only the men served over there. It was the military joint force task, JTF, Joint Task Terrorist Force, was uh, actively defending the liberties and protecting us. And that day, that trip gave me a, a good sense of what uh, our military's might is. And uh, I had to, you know, just came to terms with what's what the Pentagon means. And what does not, did not make sense to me is that here, they are trying to protect our country, right? I, I, defend me. And the situation right now is that they are trying to defend me by taking away my liberties of due process. That is still suspended under the Patriot Act. And so going back to Guantanamo Bay, I was secluded from everybody else. I was placed in a very nice modern, you know, uh, townhouse it was. Uh, and uh, every, everyone, each officer had a townhouse to himself. Their families did not join them. They were just men over there serving. Some came for six months, some came for a year. And whenever I was picked, I was picked and dropped and I was always escorted. I was not allowed to wander off, step out of the house by myself. So we were there for, I think, like two, three days. The second day was the hearing uh, of the five high-value high detainees. And when we went to the hearing, we were informed that, uh, number one, I was delayed. Somehow, you know, in such a small island, the guy lost his way. So, uh, yeah, right? Makes sense. So I was, when I got there, the proceedings had started. And uh, the judge was there and the prosecution lawyer, Mr. Swan, Swanson, yeah, that was his name. And so the judge had asked him a couple of questions. One was, you did not give me this information. I've been requesting it for the last two times. And he said, I will look into it, Your Honor, and make sure you get it. And then there was one very peculiar question. The judge said, I had, I had ordered you to give these, high, these five detainees uh, a transcript of what transpired in the previous hearings in their own language whether they spoke Afghani or whether they spoke, you know, Urdu or uh, Iraqi language, I don't know. So he said, we told, I ordered you to give it to them and as yet you have not given them. So his response was, they all speak very good English, Your Honor, so I will not, I'm not going to do that. So he was very belligerent and very, you know, challenging. But the detainees did not come out and at the meet uh, uh, over there, uh, two of the uh, detectives, you know, I was told to go and talk to them. So I went over there and talked, spoke to them. And they said, you know, Ms. Hamdani, your son Salman is really dead. He's not here in the, you know, at, over here at Guantanamo Bay. And my take was fine, he died. But the people that we are holding uh, incommunicado, they are somebody's children. They are somebody's brothers. And they are somebody's husbands or fathers. And th that is not right. Inform them. You know, but this is going back five, six years ago. Now we have a very few amount of people, you know, a few number of people living over there. So I came back from Guantanamo, but that was a very, you know, educational uh, uh, trip for me. And uh, then uh, the next important milestone, I would say, in my life. Uh, was uh, when I heard that Peter King is going to have hearings on radicalization in the uh, Muslim community. And uh, we approached from Peaceful Tomorrows to, for him to give us a meeting. So after hounding him for three, four weeks, he finally gave us a meeting in DC. Although we were all in New York, he's in New York, he made us travel all the way to DC. So three of us traveled and as we approached his office, he walked out saying that he has a meeting and we never got to meet him. So he doesn't have the courage to sit down and talk to people who are advocating for peace. And you know, and the aide said, you know, you want to say something? I said, I'm sorry, the congressman does not want to talk to me and neither do I. 
He wants to talk, here's my card, he can contact me. And he did not contact me. So when the hearings were coming up, you know, I said, I'm going to go and talk. You know, I, I want, I'm, I'm going to go and tell my story. Because this is not right, what happened to my son. So when I arrived there, um, actually, you know, the night before, Peter, what's his name? Congressman Keith Ellison had called me that, you know, is it okay if I mention your son's name? I said, fine, you can mention my son's name. So when I arrived there, he gave me his seat and he testified. And I'm sure if you, have, you must have heard, you know, that he just broke down. And uh, um, that was a very cathartic moment. That was, you know, the, a turning point, uh, not only in my life, but I would say in the history of our nation. Uh, on the social justice platform, that was a turning point because uh, everybody thought that, you know, when the whole country, especially the media, that she testified. I said, I did not say a word. It was, you know, Keith Ellison who testified on behalf of my son. And he, he broke down and he left. I sat through the whole hearing, which was a charade. And uh, so, and as of that day, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, em emotional healing in me that took place. That yes, my son's sacrifice is now acknowledged in the, and his name is resonating in the Congress, you know, on the Hill. And then this, the, then the summer I was invited by the uh, AAIP, a, a Asian American Pacific Islanders Caucus, to testify on the Hill about what happened. And SALT also, I testified on the SALT committee also. And then uh, after Osama bin Laden was taken out, you know, retribution, uh, President Obama invited us, you know, to meet him. And that was a very, you know, the most healing moment in my life because some people, you know, uh, they say, well, we don't like Obama. I said, fine, you know, it's not about liking or disliking Obama. For me, it was a moment that, yes, uh, my president has invited me to speak with him, which means he is uh, standing in solidarity with my pain, be it 10 years later. But he is acknowledging my pain and my son's sacrifice and uh, through him, it means that my country, my fellow Americans are with me also. So that was a, a very, you know, a high point in my life. And uh, somehow over these 10 years fighting for my sons, getting him justice, I was just looking at Facebook and two years ago I wrote, uh, I will be your voice and you will be my strength. And two years later, that's how it is, you know, he is my strength. And to me, he is not dead. He is, you know, he, I feel he's back in me. His energy is all back in me. And uh, I'm fighting, you know, uh, I have, somehow I've become, like Jerry said, a public person and uh, uh, a voice for the community. And there I've met a few, you know, quite a few activists now. I'm very happy to see that 10 years later, a new generation has grown up and uh, they are fighting for their rights. And uh, yes, uh, so, I've become a public person, I agree, you know, and what I've, because of what happened to me, because other Muslims died too, but they're, they're not speaking. Why they're not speaking, I don't know. I would like them to speak. I, read, I re reached out uh, last year to form a Muslim 9-11 organization, but nobody responded. So it's a tough, tough walk. It's a very tough walk, but uh, uh, bring what the future may, uh, you know, if something is wrong, you know, I mean, I believe I, 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 I have to fight. I have to speak up, you know, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Thank you. Thank you. May I say one more thing, Jerry? Uh, I know it's, it's, it's ended, but the injustice, you know, uh, is, is, has not ended. Salman was an NYPD cadet, and I requested the 9-11 memorial to acknowledge him as a cadet, as an NYPD cadet, which they refused because they said he was not uh, on the payroll. So I got a letter from uh, Commissioner Kelly, and uh, I brought it to this uh, person, uh, Daniel, his name is Daniel, I think, yeah. Uh, 
but he said, no, we have our own rules, doesn't matter. But now I just discovered that NYPD has three memorials and Salman's name is not on it either. So when I met uh, Commissioner Kelly at the Ramadan event, I asked him why is his name not on it. So he said, write a letter, and I have written a letter to him. So uh, my struggle is still going on. I want to see his due uh, sacrifice and his due place in history acknowledged.